All right. All right. We're still having people join us uh, every, we're still having a couple of people a minute join us right now, but let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the 2021 Allied Health Conference. This is being held by Missouri Community College Association and State Fair Community College. It's also sponsored by Central Methodist University. We have nearly 40 health science educators from nine different community colleges who have registered for this uh, conference. So we've got really, really good representation from across the state. Um, we've also opened the conference up to Central Methodists as our sponsors. We've opened it up to the University of Missouri's um, health science instructors because a lot of times when MCCA holds a webinar like this or holds a conference like this, um, it's a professional development opportunity and we keep that in house. We want that to be a benefit to our members, but we felt like this was more of a public service um, and we wanted to cast a very wide net. If there's a health science um, instructor in the state or really anywhere uh, who needs to be hearing this or wants to be hearing this, we want them in the room. Um, so there are a lot of statistics out there um, we're talking about compassion fatigue. There are a lot of statistics out there about staff turnover, especially since the start of the pandemic. Um, I will just throw one out there really quick. And Dr. Dempsey, I apologize if I'm stepping on your toes here. Um, NSI Nursing Solutions, which is a recruiting agency, found they put out their staff retention report back in March, and it found that staff RN turnover rates increased by 2.8 percentage points, all going all the way up to 18.7% in 2020. Now, 2.8, almost three percentage points may not sound like very much, but that's increasing by nearly 20% and getting the overall staff turnover rate to nearly 20% or nearly one in five um, RNs who are just walking away right now. Um, it's an incredibly important issue. It was one of the very first things that Dr. Hutton Gann talked about when she and I began talking a few months ago. Um, so this should be great. This should be exciting. We could not have done this without Dr. Rhonda Hutton Gann from over at State Fair Community College. We couldn't have done this without our presenters. That's Dr. Andrew Ferguson of State Fair Community College and Dr. Christy Dempsey of Press Ganey. We also couldn't have done this without our sponsor, Central Methodist University. And so we're going to pitch it over to Dr. DeGan Dixon. She has a few words to say for, for us from CMU. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, very much for allowing us the opportunity to not only sponsor, but to just say a few words and, and welcome everybody to the Allied Health uh, Conference. And we too appreciate um, our community college partners and work very closely with uh, Dr. Hutton Gann and um, many others across the state. So we appreciate what you're doing for not only um, um, our, our industry, but also for our community college partners. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to give you a few updates from Central Methodist University. Um, welcome, especially from Provost Golstad. Um, you know, she loves her MCCA partners and we look forward to seeing everyone uh, in November at the conference. And, you got to stop by that green table and pick up all of your CMU swag and um, uh, show it off and um, uh, be sure to stop by and say hi to Rita. Um, I think most everyone knows that we are a big sponsor of our community colleges in the state of Missouri. We, spot, we actually partner with every community college uh, in the state of Missouri. Um, and most of you may know, but I want to make sure you do, that we transfer pretty much uh, every degree that our community college partner offers. Um, if we don't have the degree in itself in our catalog, where we can do a, a seamless transfer such as RN to BSN, which is a very important topic for today's conference, um, then we have what I, I call them catch-all degrees, but um, we have um, applied science degrees that allow us to transfer in a subject area into a general area, uh, one that we use in the allied health area because we, we don't have all of the allied health programs like you do, um, you know, surgical tech, uh, medical assisting, medical information technology, um, laboratory technology, dental hygiene, all of those programs that you offer that we don't necessarily offer, we transfer those into our bachelors of health sciences and allows us to do a seamless transfer of all of those allied health courses into that general um, program. Of course, we have um, transfer programs that work very seamlessly with RNWSN or the OTA. 
Um, and we also have a medical care, uh, med, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, medical, um, I wanna use the word medical, healthcare administration um, bachelor's degree as well. And if I can just share my screen real quick, I'll just show you a few things that I wanted to, um, to share with you. Let's see. Uh, the health science program um, is one that I was telling you about. Again, it specifies the AAS to the BHS uh, degree. Certainly, we have the RN to BSN and many other um, allied health programs that we that we transfer. I mentioned earlier that we um, we work with every community college in the state of Missouri. Uh, we also have some out of state partnerships that we work with as well, but not as extensively as we do for uh, with our Missouri community colleges. Here's the transfer guides that we were, I was mentioning where we transfer programs. You can certainly go into our website and see the numerous transfer guides. I have one pulled up here. Let's see, I'm, I'm having problems with uh, my cursor wanting to, there we go. This is what one of our transfer guides looks like. We'll have several of these at the uh, MCCA conference, but they're certainly available on our webpage. And just one of the other quick things I wanted to point out is, um, you know, our tuition. We actually, um, you know, stay competitive with tuition throughout the, um, or I shouldn't say throughout the state, but what we try to do is we try to stay competitive with our uh, community college partners tuition rates so that um, our tuition can stay affordable for uh, your graduates of your allied health programs. And I just wanted to quickly, people ask me, you know, what are some of the new and upcoming things? And if you didn't know, we have a rodeo team. And if Rita were here, she'd say yeehaw. So um, they're doing some, some great things. And uh, that's actually in partnership with one of our community college partners. We created this program with Three Rivers, um, but we, um, you know, this, this is available to any student no matter what campus, no matter if they're online, no matter you know where they live, because they can do competitive rodeo, um, you know, at different locations other than in the uh, southeast region of the state. So, so welcome and um, thank you again for the opportunity, and I hope you have a good conference. Thank you, Dr. Degan Dixon. Yeehaw, yeehaw, CMU. Thank you so much for all of your support. They uh, like there's absolutely zero question. CMU is one of our biggest supporters of the community colleges here in Missouri. Um, so thank you again for that. Um, like I said, I started talking to Dr. Hutton Gann a few months ago um, about the conference. What should we be talking about? And, and she didn't hesitate. She said that healthcare industry leaders are extremely concerned about compassion fatigue right now and what it's doing to their staff. Um, they wanted students equipped for these really hard grinding moments in their lives and in their careers. Um, and, and it was really important to me that we have not just us saying that this is what we're hearing from healthcare industry leaders, but we actually have one of those leaders on here to give you kind of a boots on the ground um, explanation of what they are seeing and what they hope students are prepared for in their lives. So Dr. Christy Dempsey is here. Um, she is the Chief Nursing Officer Emerita at Press Ganey. She has over three decades of healthcare experience. She serves on a variety of boards. I could read her entire bio to you right now, but it's just like a list of all the accomplishments and a list of all the things that she does and a list of all the things that make me wonder how she does all of those things in only an uh, eight hour workday or in only a 24 hour day, period. Um, but one of the very cool things, what she is, she has twice been named as one of the top safety experts in the entire country by Becker's Hospital Review. And she is here to tell us, like I said, she is one of those healthcare industry leaders who can explain to us right now really what they're seeing out there and how important what Dr. Ferguson is about to talk about. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, and I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C., from the American Academy of Nursing. Uh, so I can tell you that this is a, a very hot topic right now. And it's always been a hot topic and just made more so by the pandemic. Uh, so if you don't know Press Ganey, Press Ganey is uh, far and away the largest uh, organization to study patient experience, 
nurse experience, employee engagement, physician engagement. And I say that because we did a flight risk assessment of uh, 100,000 healthcare employees across the United States. And what we found is that employee engagement ratings dropped at twice the rate among nurses, RNs, compared to non-RNs in the past 12 months. We also know that nurses under 35 at, are at particular risk of leaving, and not just leaving your organization, but leaving the profession. And so we know that compassion fatigue is real. We also know that it's exacerbated by the pandemic, but not only by the pandemic. And I think it's important to know a couple of uh, definitions. And I, this may feed very well into Dr. Ferguson's remarks, but moral injury. So injury to one's moral conscience and values producing guilt and shame and often a sense of betrayal and anger and profound moral disorientation. And that's what our healthcare folks are going through right now is moral injury. There is so much that they wanna do and for a variety of reasons they can't. And it is producing this kind of moral disorientation. My colleague, Cinder Rushton at uh, Johns Hopkins talks about moral resilience as the capacity of a person to sustain or restore their integrity in response to moral complexity and confusion and distress or setback. And I think it's important that we understand that Compassion fatigue, resilience is not necessarily the opposite of compassion fatigue. And what we need to do is not bounce back. People think of resilience as bouncing back. We need to not bounce back because we weren't in a good place to start with before the pandemic. We need to bounce forward as a result of this pandemic. And so I, what, what you didn't hear in my bio is I am a graduate of a community college. And I heard you talk about Three Rivers. I started at Three Rivers and I graduated from Missouri Southern. And that foundation has been so important in my academic career and in my professional career. And I, ask that you pay particular attention to what is going on right now in healthcare because you have a profound opportunity and obligation as these graduates go into healthcare, you can make such a difference. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Cliff, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dempsey. Uh, it, just to give you guys some background, we all jumped on a practice Zoom earlier today and I was asking, making sure everybody's audio and video worked. I was making sure that people who wanted to present could present and, and so on and so forth, just making sure everything went as smooth as possible. And so I asked Dr. Dempsey, everything good to go? You feel, you, you feel ready? And she said, oh my gosh, we talked about this exact issue just this morning. Um, so it's being talked about an awful lot. I also wish that everybody here could have been on the Zoom call when we first started talking to both Dr. Huttengan and Dr. Ferguson, uh, because it was just kind of a meet and greet. And Dr. Huttengan said, I think I have this person who could be really perfect for this particular issue and, and talk to everybody. And, and I, she began listing, Dr. Ferguson began listing all of the various trauma events that she and her team have been responding to both natural disasters man-made disasters over the last 25, 30 years, I believe it was. Um, and she started saying, do you remember seeing this in the news? Yes, well, we went to that. Did you remember seeing this in the news? Yes, well, we went to that. And then I finally said, where all has your work taken you when it comes to trauma response? And she said, every single continent in the world except for Antarctica. Um, so she has uh, been doing a lot of really great work. She immediately started asking, I can handle groups as large or as small as you want. Um, she was 
she was really ready to go and fired up about getting this message out and making sure that um, everybody is, is, is equipped, like I said, for these really hard moments in their careers. So today, Dr. Ferguson is planned. This is a two-part webinar, just FYI. Today we're talking about, and Dr. Ferguson, correct me if I, if I get this wrong and I like switched them up or anything like that, but I think I got this right. Today we're going to talk about um, dealing with compassion fatigue yourself on Wednesday the 13th at 10 a.m., so that's just in five days. We're going to talk about building compassion fatigue into your curriculum so you can help your students. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Cliff Judy. I appreciate that. So um, I'm a, thank you, everyone who's joined us this afternoon. Um, I think this is such an important topic. Um, it is a very significant phenomenon affecting our professions. Thank you to, to both doctors for giving kind of an intro to those types of things. So to give kind of an in, um, a, uh, introduction, um, it will be a two-part presentation. Today, I will talk about identifying compassion fatigue in ourselves, our colleagues, and our students. And then next Wednesday, I will discuss how to prevent and treat compassion fatigue and some ways to um, address compassion fatigue within the educational curriculum. Therefore, the majority of today's presentation will be about recognition of symptoms and what compassion fatigue is and also what it is not. There are a lot of um, overlap in diagnosis and phenomena that happen whenever there is um, stress and trauma type events. So I'll help distinguish those a little bit. Um, so throughout the um, presentation, I will periodically stop and ask if there's questions. However, feel free at any time to ask questions, put um, questions in the um, chat box. Um, Cliff, Judy, and Katie are going to monitor that and let me know when, um, when there's a question. It will be an interactive session, so um, I am interested in your feedback and your experiences regarding compassion fatigue. Uh, we are in this together. Um, we're all um, health science educators and people dealing in the profession, and this is a, a big front that we're facing, so um, the more tools we have, the better off we'll be. So the first thing I will um, say is I'm going to um, share my screen into a PowerPoint. Let's get that going. Oops, wrong one. There we go. Is that showing? Compassion fatigue. Yep, we're good to go. We can see it. Wonderful. Okay. So um, I wanted to start by saying first off that um, the photos and art throughout the PowerPoint are either free clip art from the internet or I've had specific permission from um, the various folks that are in the pictures throughout this. Okay. Okay, so I put, I included a couple of general definitions and um, I appreciate Dr. Dempsey's um, definitions as well. In fact, I would like to add moral injury into the collection of um, terms that are also used for compassion fatigue with her permission. Um, so to outline kind of what this PowerPoint is about too, my references are listed at the bottom of each slide as well as the end of the presentation. You'll notice that some slides do not have references listed. Um, this is because it's information that I have directly collected in working with the populations from around the world. The experiences in compassion fatigue in different settings. So um, there are many ways that compassion fatigue are defined. Um, I chose to include a dictionary definition because it is very generic. It's what a lot of people think when they think of compassion fatigue, which is a little bit different than healthcare folks because um, 
were a little closer to the fire than the than the typical person. Um, I've also included in the next slide um, a compassion fatigue guru definition um, from Charles Figley. He's another um, a big pioneer in the field. And so um, we'll go into those. Um, the first thing I want to say is the, um, this part just right. The physical and mental exhaustion and emotional withdrawal experienced by those who care for sick or traumatized people over an extended period of time. So there's caveats for that. It doesn't necessarily mean traumatized. It can mean um, people that have more needs than ourselves. So when I hear the word traumatized, I think of um, like a trauma nurse or um, those of you who work in the uh, medical surgical situations, traumatic events can be psychosocial as well as physical. So I kind of want to um, explain that I'm throughout the presentation, I'm using the word trauma and traumatize also in association, in association with stress. And Dr. Ferguson, I apologize for interrupting you real quick. Are we <laughs> still on the title? Uh, slide or have you moved on? Because what everybody is currently seeing is still the title slide. Hmm, I see that we are moved on. And just throwing it out there for everybody, um, Dr. Ferguson has said several times that this is meant to be interactive. We want a conversation. So please do, uh, if you have questions, throw them into the Q&A. If you um, have anything, let us know. And we are going to be, um, uh, Dr. Ferguson was saying later that we are going to have specific moments where we are soliciting some interaction from you, from you all. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we're good to go now. What do you think? Are you seeing it now? Yes, we are. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So the second portion of the definition is apathy or indifference toward the suffering of others as a result of overexposure to tragic news stories, images, and the subsequent appeals for assistance. So um, again, there's many ways that this is defined. And um, these are the simplistic ones. So I, I do, again, I want to emphasize that when I use the word trauma, it's in reference to um, many, many things. Okay, so this is a definition by Figley. This is one of his most recent definitions. He started um, defining this a long time ago. And as Dr. Dempsey said, compassion fatigue has been around for centuries. Um, as we start categorizing it and calling it different things, um, it, it starts to take on its own um, identity. So with this definition, the, it's a state experienced by those helping people or animals in distress. I think I saw a veterinarian on the panel. Um, it's an extreme state of tension and preoccupation with suffering of those being helped to the degree that it can create a secondary traumatic stress for the helper. You can see it's a little more detailed and um, more descriptive than the first definition. This is my collection of words, and this is where I would like to add a moral injury. And you'll hear these terms in different places, different times. If you take a look at them, you've probably heard one here or there in um, dealing with caregivers. And by caregivers, that stems from everything from a parent to a doctor, nurse, everybody on the Zoom call. As I can imagine, there's a lot of words that are interchangeable with compa compassion fatigue or at least overlap. So I do want to um, differentiate compassion fatigue from a couple of formal diagnoses that are described in the DSM. The DSM is a Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is a book used by healthcare professionals to organize symptoms into diagnoses. So there is a discussion in um, it underway talking about 
including compassion fatigue in the DSM. It currently is not. However, um, many of the symptoms, again, overlap with several other uh, phenomena. So um, it is not a new concept. It is very prevalent in the US, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll go more into more detail about the circumstances leading to it in just a little bit. So um, initially I wanted to give an overview of the limited research regarding compassion fatigue related specifically to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we'll discuss um, compassion fatigue a little more generally. So, we will move on to the next. So the first thing I would like you to do is to, um, before we get into the weeds, is to answer these questions, either on paper or on computer. And they may seem like very negative questions. Um, again, this first half of the program is identifying and um, recognizing symptoms. And so it is focused on the negative. Um, but the second half is to um, be on problem resolution and um, a little bit change in focus. So if you take a few moments to answer these and actually write them down, whether it's on your tablet or your or paper. And if you could take a screenshot of this slide so you will still have the questions, I'm going to turn off the share screen for a moment so we can see each other. So Cliff Judy, can you show us each other in the classroom? He showed a neat little trick earlier that I had not seen on Zoom before. Let's see if I can pull this off. Okay, great. Hmm. I think it's only going to show the uh, panelists, but we'll see if this works. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not showing the participants. I apologize. Um, but I tell you what, if anybody let's get off of this. All right. Um, I am monitoring all of the attendees. Um, so if you raise your hand, um, I will see it. I'll make sure that you're allowed to talk all of that. So if anybody wants to raise their hand and share, please do so. We do have somebody raising their hand already. All right, Sarah. Sarah, Sarah Hardison, yep. you got us? Yep. Hello, sorry. Hello. Hello. It's not showing me, but that's okay. <laughs> so you raised your hand. You have uh, a response here for Dr. Ferguson or want to be the first person to throw your uh, two cents out there? In regards to the three questions that we just presented? Yes. Yes. Yep, I'll be brave. So um, I think one of the things that's really changed since the um, COVID pandemic is previously we were not offering some courses online and now we are. Um, and that's definitely been a lot different. I'm not really getting the same interactions or connections with our students. And they, um, I can tell that they've been working a lot in their jobs. So they're very stressed and they're very quick to answer and very anxious. So if I don't get them an answer immediately, um, sometimes they can they can get a, a little angry. Um, and I've just noticed that they just seem like they're very stressed all the time. And that's a lot different than what it was like before. Absolutely. 
we see a lot of that. Um, I think probably everyone on here, and not just with students, also with each other. <laughs> I find myself wanting answers more quickly and um, expecting them and uh, other people kind of being demanding that same type of thing. So fantastic example, Sarah. What else? And I have a list of all of the attendees so I can even call on you. <laughs> comes to it. What other types of things um, to address the first one? How's your life different since the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you again, Sarah. Who else is going to be brave? Sheila. Sheila Taylor. Yes, hi. I, uh, I think one thing that has changed certainly has been um, just the interaction between other people. Uh, my husband started working from home uh, all the time. Uh, that has been a stressor, uh, certainly, because I actually went back to work. And that was a good thing, in a way, because it did take us out of that conflict that sometimes occurred at home. Uh, but with my students, certainly, I realized that I don't have the same interaction with them. And just like Sarah said, a lot of it being online, a lot of them being much more impatient, but then again, so am I. Another very good example. I know um, the institution I'm working in, one of the goals of administration now is um, improving our student engagement. And it's been identified by students as well as um, administration to um, that this is an area that needs work. And is it all due to COVID-19 pandemic? I don't know. Um, I think we probably could have used some work in every area prior to that, but it has amplified things to the point where we notice it um, with discomfort. What ways do you feel like you have changed since the pandemic? Are we, uh, you want to stay with, and, and I apologize, anyway. Ms. Taylor, I, uh, I, I called you Sheila, but I see that your name there is spelled uh, Shelia. And as a person whose uh, first name always gets mistaken for Chris and who has a uh, woman's last name, my name gets messed up all the time. So I apologize to you on that one. Um, how about we go over to Allison? So ways that I've changed, um, I feel more stressed. I have trouble sleeping. Um, I feel like similar to what um, the gal before me indicated, she, her husband was at home and, you know, that dynamic changed. I feel like I have developed quite a higher tolerance of my children than I've ever had if that makes sense, because we've been together so much while they were home for school and from school and I was at home working. Um, there was a, a totally different um, dynamic in our household these days um, because we have spent so much time together. I think the challenges that I am dealing with these days and probably everybody else too are more complex than they've ever, ever been. So there's a lot more um, stress around decision making than I've had in the past. Yes, it takes longer too. just all of the factors that must be contemplated. Um, it, it adds time to everything, which is an additional stressor on top of the beginning ones. So fantastic, Allison. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Allison. Um, Ms. Taylor, did you uh, raise your hand a second time or was your hand just uh, still up in the air when I saw that just a second ago? No, it was, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no worries. Yeah. I was I'm just sorry. making sure that I didn't yeah. see it wrong. So yeah, if you I was just going to say, share, by all means, if you've okay. already shared and yeah. you want to let somebody else go, by all means. Well, I was just going to say, yes, my name is Sheila, actually. It is Sheila. And, okay, I didn't and, mess it up. Uh, I am the veterinarian. Um, and so this is also an area, besides teaching, I, I'm a veterinarian. And so this has been a major thing in veterinary practice as well, in compassion fatigue. And, and I can say one of the reasons I went into teaching was because, yes, I had that compassion fatigue 
and burnout in practice. So uh, this has been going on for a long time. And as I, as I as has been said, yes, the pandemic certainly has exacerbated the situation. We are fully masked at our college and that drives me crazy because I cannot see facial expressions anymore. And so I don't know what my students are actually thinking. And that really drives me nuts. Yes, I get into that a little bit later and um, show some examples of that. Um, we do a lot of mind reading with the with these masks, right? So you don't get all of the same social cues that we once did. Great example. Okay, one more person in the obstacles that you're now facing. And uh, if nobody else, please do re raise your hand if you have something to say, but I'm just going to read what we've got going in the chat as well. Kathy Pritchard also mentioned uh, it's more hectic, too many priorities, less student and people interaction, which I feel like is kind of becoming a theme right now. Um, and Sarah, who um, was our first brave uh, hand raiser, mentioned that grief is um, a really huge obstacle right now. Okay. Anything else from anybody else? We're still on uh, point number two, right? Question number two? Number three. Oh, what we are on number three. Are okay, facing? cool. Yes. And I happen to know Dr. Mannion on the um, participant list. Do you want to add one? <laughs> Dr. Mannion, you've been called out. I just, <laughs> I just enabled your talking. If you don't feel comfortable, no big deal. But uh, the gauntlet has been laid down. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll add. Um, Obstacles yeah, with currently the, facing. With the... Um, the pandemic, absolutely. Um, everything that was mentioned hits home a hundred percent, um, with things being absolutely closed down, um, and focusing solely on the family life. Right. Um, I think that that dynamic has definitely changed. Um, but now with things opening back up, um, and things, that are partially opening back up, right? So like for myself, I was able to work from home, but now they're calling me back into the office while my childcare isn't necessarily opening back up. So, you know, the schools are opening back up and the sports are opening back up, but um, the, you know, before care and the aftercare and the childcare is not necessarily. So that is posing a huge problem, which is a huge stressor. Um, and everybody wants immediate, you know, um, answers, immediate everything when really it would be much, much more helpful to like, just take a step back and be like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's see what we can do here. <laughs> if that makes sense. Megan, you are hundred percent correct. Um, childcare and family life has been, um, on the top of the list of the things that have been indicated, um, as a contributor to compassion fatigue throughout this whole um, ordeal. So thank you all for participating in that portion. And then we'll kind of talk about some of those same things as we continue through the rest of the presentation. But keep in mind too, that um, your information, collect the information that folks share with you, and um, as well as what you realize yourself, I, I would like you to think about yourself and your life and those around you as we go through this next part. If I can get to the right part, let's see here. There we go. <laughs> okay, so in this next um, section, I'm gonna show you just a few recent studies that describe the COVID specific issues that are supposed to be related to the COVID pandemic. However, we know these things have been around long before this ever happened. And then I'm gonna uh, talk about the overall effects of compassion fatigue and how to recognize them in ways that we haven't necessarily, um, it hasn't all been mentioned. Okay, the first one, the educators. Okay, so who does compassion fatigue affect everyone in every way? We're all human. Uh, we all have emotions, except in a few isolated um, pathology type incidents, but educators, we are known for our tendency toward empathy and compassion. We 
it is hard to feel inspired by a classroom full of negative emotion or under a COVID cloud. And, and what we're going into the industry, it's hard to be motivated for those things, as well as balancing all of the stressors that are directly related to COVID. So I'm going to do a lot of COVID-centered stuff, and then I'm going to do general types of compassion fatigue things. So this first part, we'll, I'll talk about educators, then I'll talk about students, and then those specifically in healthcare, and then what's happening in institutions. And Dr. Dempsey gave kind of a glimpse of that in the healthcare field. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more. I do want you to keep in mind, however, everyone participating in this lecture, you are an expert in experiencing the things that I'm going to talk, I'm going to discuss. Um, compassion fatigue is so widespread, whether it's a little bit or a lot of it, or what extreme it has taken you to, this has played a um, toll on all of us. Oops, students. Here we go. So um, these couple of studies um, were about around 200 students. And you can see these are some of the things we're seeing in our classrooms. And you can see some of these things over um, electronic, whether it's Zoom or whatever mode you're using. Um, the depression, anxiety, mental health in general. Sometimes you're not quite sure what, what you're seeing, but you know that something is not right. Um, abuse and harassment has really increased um, judgment. So I'm going to get in a little bit more with the judgment um, in a little bit. It's within this pandemic, there's so much of a political climate surrounding it, the judgment of ourselves, of each other, um, feeling judged. All of those things are um, very, very prominent with the student life as well as other folks, but this was identified specifically with the students. Illness, poor concentration, disrupted sleep, and I think Allison had mentioned that as well. Reduced support, and sometimes, like Dr. Mannion said, um, reduced support may be childcare. It may be, um, you know, work doesn't understand or line up with everything that's happening. Reduced support for our students in um, financial aid or financial opportunities. The job, the part-time job they may have had may not be available to them to make their educational opportunity um, a reality. Decreased opportunities in general. Um, there's a large report of the minority caregiver and identity isolation. So COVID has enforced an isolation for everyone to a degree. When folks are already feel marginalized or isolated, it has amplified that even more. So the disrupted social interactions and um, overall decreased academic performance. I know our Dean, um, Dr. Rhonda Hutton-Gann has been very, very focused on student um, success and how do we make that happen for them? And in person, the social connection and um, avoiding the electronic has really been a key to several of our programs, not always the case in other places, but um, her focus on it, I think has been very, um, detrimental to a lot of student success. We're doing whatever we can to help them eliminate or keep some of these um, effects to a minimum. Okay, healthcare providers. So <laughs> one of the things I think is a little bit funny. So we are, as educators, influencing and um, encouraging and supporting all of our students to grow up into these problems, right? So it's like you can get rid of some of the stressors that you have as a student to face more and different stressors in the actual healthcare field. So it makes it difficult to inspire as well for us as well as a student. You know, we've had a lot of students drop out because they know what they're coming into. Um, and I don't know if they were even more informed if they wouldn't, we wouldn't lose even more. So uh, this, this particular study um, for healthcare providers, it was a meta-analysis. And um, you'll see one of the second things on here is judgment that I had mentioned before. Um, 
in the whole health and community judgment. I don't know about any of you, but like if you're running into a convenience store, you forget your mask, like you have to have it. Um, you have to go back to the car to get it. Um, people might judge you, even if you're the only one in the store, you feel like you need to have it on. Or you go in and everybody's got their mask on except one person that was darting in. The judgment that happens toward that one person is much more than it ever would have been before. And, um, and it is a community health issue. And so what we're doing to and for and with each other does matter. And um, it, it creates a whole additional stressor and dynamic that we're just not used to. We're having to adjust. And anytime there's change, it, um, it's a stressor on the brain. And it, even if it's a positive change, that is a, still a stressor for the brain, which is also going to add to the um, overall effect. So for healthcare providers, and I think Dr. Dempsey alluded on a lot of these things, uh, just there's a, we're losing a lot of folks. They're getting out of the profession. Um, they have fears of contracting illness, um, of dying, unintentional harm, um, causes financial burdens, being ineffective in the role that they're playing. Suicide rates have gone up. Actually one that I had read, um, it, um, was specific to veterinary medicine, that the suicide rates in the veterinary practice have um, really, really increased. Um, there's increased errors. When you have more to do, less time to do, and you're exhausted, errors are going to happen. So, and in medical care, an error can be a life. That's a lot of pressure on us and those around us. Also decreased self-care. I don't know about you guys, but I know I've got extra cans of um, dry shampoo. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, can I get another day out of my hair before I have to do this again? Because I'm really tired. I've got other things to do. Um, periodontal disease goes up. People are brushing their teeth less often. Um, people aren't flossing. They've got other things to do. And I know that as far as I am the dental hygiene director, at the college that I'm teaching currently. And this is a huge thing, the decreased self-care, skin care, hair care, um, oral care, just overall care, not to mention, and I, um, a widespread thing, the weight gain. So there are many, many of us that have put on some pounds. It is a joke that it is literally the COVID-19 pounds um, that you put on from this pandemic because of the decreased self-care. Um, we also don't have access to be able to do the things we always do. The gyms are closed. You can't be outside. Weather may be an issue. Um, social pressure in self-care, all of those types of things are issues. Okay, so healthcare and education. Um, these are the things that are happening to our educational programs and our professions more in general. So when you hear these, they make you feel heavier and more forlorn. Um, there's a decreased number in the workforce, which Dr. Dempsey alluded to, decreased quality of health care provided. Now, does that mean that the health care providers in the field aren't good health care providers? No, it means we've got additional stressors and um, things that new things that we're learning. And um, we're different providers now than we were on day one, and then add new things in there. And there's additional things. So um, all of our growth takes a little bit of a step back when we're not doing the same things that we've always done. There's emotional breakdowns, a lot of change of profession, sometimes get out of the profession completely. Decreased training opportunities. Um, there used to be a big um, word in healthcare of cross-training, learning some skills that you can do a little bit outside of your um, range of things to be able to increase effective care. And uh, because of the um, demands on our current physicians and the workloads that we're experiencing, those are not there. They're not there. We have a decreased admission to higher education programs, increased conflicts, and that is across the board with family, with educators, with peers, um, whether it's a small conflict or just rubbed the wrong way, there's increased conflict across the board. Um, extended time away, increased dissatisfaction in relationships, 
and a lack of resources. So the support to mental health needs, it's there's not such a stigma that there used to be in seeking help for mental health needs. However, it may be someone needs extra care, not necessarily enough to see a professional, but um, some additional support, some things to make them in a position to be the best version of themselves, being the best healthcare professional or the best educator or the best student, whatever that may be. And it, um, it's not readily available and we don't always know what to do about it. So that's another reason for these um, discussions that we're going to have over the next two is to give you a few tools to be able to do those things. So um, the next slide um, is just to show you a snapshot of some of the student participation that I know every single one of you is going to recognize. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the things that we're seeing in this next slide. So <laughs> this picture is a picture of several students that are um, on a Zoom call or um, an educational session. And uh, I do have permission to post it. They were happy to take part. So I wanted, I, their directions were to um, act how they felt in their Zoom sessions. So we'll kind of go through these a little bit. In the upper left, um, let me get my thing over there. The upper left um, picture, this person, their camera is sideways. If they even know that it's on um, and it's tipped over or something, they're on their phone and um, clearly not into the discussion that is happening there. Um, so that if, if that's your student that you're trying to um, talk about um, cardiac care and that's the response you have, it's not motivating to know, um, to want to be one of their patients one day. So the middle top, this is the very worst position. So have you ever been an educator where you are um, trying to make eye contact on Zoom with whoever's speaking, and they happen to be on one side of your screen and not in the center of the screen. And we're so ingrained for those social interactions. As one of um, Sarah or Sheila had mentioned, like we're looking for those social cues. And if you don't have them or you're trying to interact with this computer, you get things like that. You know, if somebody's talking to you like this middle gal here this whole time, you think, what is going on? This, it's not an interpersonal reaction or interpersonal action. The next one, this gal, she's looking for whatever's going on under her computer, whether it's a toddler or a pterodactyl or a ferret that has run across the floor underneath. Um, if she knows the camera is on, she may be talking, um, but we get a lot of that in our classes. So, uh, you know, just acknowledging those types of things. So all three of those here are looking like compassion fatigue. So they're not into it. They don't know how to respond or don't know how to best interact through this mode of communication that's affecting all of it. It's an extra stressor. All three of those people are gonna have obstacles to success. So down one, the middle right is drinking something and really into it. And if you're a presenter or an educator, I don't know about everyone on this call, but I kind of start getting hungry. And I want something to eat. I want something to drink. It, you know, it's distracting to everyone, but it is something that happens in almost every Zoom call and um, it's difficult to control. And it's not necessarily that way if we meet in person. However, sometimes it is. Sometimes we'll have a lunch and learn where everyone brings in food, but it's usually not that type of thing. Um, you don't, it's not a matter of you're not sharing or not eating with everyone because you're not in the same place, but it's a very distracting thing that happens. This center one, I like to call it that this person is looking directly into your soul um, and they look like they're looking at you, watching your every move and like that they're really almost looking through you, but they may not even be on the same screen that you are. So you have to consider you don't know exactly what's going on, but she looks like she is right there with you. And um, yeah, so. Um, then the middle left, this person is melting. She is slowly sinking. Um, she might be asleep. 
uh, it's hard to say, but um, the information is just pulling her down um, <laughs> with every ongoing concept. Okay, the bottom left, she is clearly daydreaming. She's looking up and you can see in her glasses, the reflection on um, from the screen to her glasses. She's not on the same page that you are either. So it's like, even though she looks like she's daydreaming, maybe thinking about a concept that you may have presented just recently, she's, she's looking at what she's got on her Walmart cart. There's that. And then this one that's looking over the camera, she might be praying, um, but more likely she's probably talking to someone standing above her computer. Eyebrows are up, she's interacting. Um, you can't tell what's going on under the mask and uh, it, it's hard to, to read that whole situation. And then this last gal, um, she's kind of laughing and looking off to the side. She's clearly having a better time than anybody else in this session. And it makes you want to be there too. So she's di distracted by something in her environment. And um, this is a Zoom call that I bet, like I said, if you haven't been one of these people, you have definitely experienced one of them. In, uh, in the last couple of years through all of these things. So I included that just to know kind of what you're looking at. Um, you know, when you see these things, the compassion fatigue, it, the, the tiredness, the um, inability to concentrate, that other things are going on and some of the effects that have been um, changed with the virtual presentation. So I want to... Let's see here. Well, I'm trying to um, stop share and it's not letting me. Did you take away my privileges? There we go. I did not. You should still be able to. There we go. Okay. So um, questions and comments so far, and then we'll get into um, a little bit different direction. Feel free to raise your hands. I am monitoring there. You can also pretty much at any time um, throw a question into the Q&A box. I will see that and I will wait for the uh, hopefully appropriate time for me to throw that out there so we can have some further interaction there. Um, we are recording this webinar, so everybody is aware. So if there's anything that you missed or you found especially relevant and you're going to want to go back to that, um, we will have that available for everybody. Any questions, any comments, any anything about what we just went through? Um, and by the way, I'm hearing like, it, uh, I know that we're talking about, um, I know that we're talking about the healthcare industry. I know that we're talking about education, but man, this all just piles on over into just about anything. Um, I've experienced a ton of these same things in my own life, having a teenager who was doing virtual freshman year down in the basement. I've got a kindergartner and a first grader right now. I mean, like all of this just spills over into pretty much any industry, I feel like. Absolutely. So what are some of the other things that you've seen on Zoom calls? As far as me? You um, or Amanda audience. Yeah, so I'm trying to think as far as like a good Zoom example. I'm not coming up with a good Zoom example off the top of my head, but probably the biggest example that I've had during the pandemic was about a year ago, um, right about this time, it was either in the first or second month of my daughter being in kindergarten and nobody else was home. And I was supposed to be giving a presentation um, or a talk about a status of something over the phone. This was before I was with MCCA. Uh, so I'm trying to get the kindergartner through some kind of a virtual something. We're still early in the year, so she hasn't quite figured out the Zooms and the iPad and the everything like that. I'm trying to help her. I'm trying to be ready for this presentation that my supervisor had me uh, giving to other people to just kind of let them know what we were about to do as far as this project goes. And I had myself muted and all of a sudden I hear in my ear, Cliff, Cliff, are you there? Ah, shoot, they pitched it to me. And I was so focused on the six-year-old that I completely forgot what I was supposed to be doing over here. I unmuted myself. I said, I'm so sorry. 
you know, here's what we've got going. And I talk for maybe a minute and a half or two minutes. And we've got the virtual kindergarten going over here, which is super noisy. And finally, after about two minutes, my boss, my supervisor got in my ear and, and she said, hey, Cliff, I'm so sorry. Can you move to a different part of the house, you know, where it's not quite so, you know, where it's not quite so noisy? And I'm looking around and I just I had to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. You know, I, I swear I will mute myself except for the point, except for points where I absolutely have to be talking. I will try and deal with this a little bit, but no, I, I can't, I can't move to a different part of the house. I am stretched so thin and that's not a choice I really have right now. Um, so that's probably my biggest one that I always come back to of like, my gosh, how are we juggling all of this? Um, I believe... I believe we have somebody raising their hands, Dr. Mannion. I have some Zoom stories. I feel like, um, and I apologize in advance because some of these are um, possibly inappropriate, but um, I feel like they need to be said. So I myself, um, right when the pandemic started, um, you know, uh, my kids were at home, we were at home. Um, so I was on Zoom and I had set it up you know, window behind me and, you know, made sure nothing was in the way. Like it made it sure that everything was like appropriate. Right. Because, you know, you have to have this space like that because the whole rest of the house is crazy. So my, uh, one of my children had let the dog out and right in the middle of a question that they was proposed to me, my dog who was in the background decided to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, here we go. So, and then people commented and everything. So yeah, it, it was lovely. It was lovely. And then another time, um, the dog was trying to get my attention and you just see a paw like coming over toward my face. Like <laughs> they wanted to be on zoom. So that was lovely. And then another time, this wasn't myself, but I felt so terrible. Um, cause I deal with a lot of people. So like when I'm on zoom, um, it, it could be hundreds of people on, on, on the call. So, uh, there's this one girl, um, who she, she had multiple children, small children. Um, so she was very distracted and, um, her camera was not on, she was not on mute and she thought she was. So of course they called her out and said, can you unmute this or can you put yourself on mute? And so she, instead of putting herself on mute, she hit the camera. And she happened to be breastfeeding at the time. And then she immediately went off and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> like, oh, I feel so bad. But things like that happen all the time. Um, and people are so distracted. And, um, you know, I myself doing multiple things um, all of the time. So I feel like um, I'm doing too many things. Cause you know, the old saying of, you know you're spread so thin, you're not doing anything well. Um, I feel like that most of the time, um, which is definitely makes me more tired, makes me more depressed, makes me disappointed in myself. You know, it adds all of those things. So, so anyway, those are my stories. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for sharing. Does anybody else have anything? I'm not seeing anybody else raise their hands for right now, but again, if you do, please raise your hand. I will monitor everything. I am monitoring Q and A and uh, yeah. All right, for this next part, why are these things happening? Okay, so trauma. Um, and I'd said before that trauma and stress, um, not necessarily that they're interchangeable, but they're very closely related. So the experience of overwhelming physical or psychological stress is considered trauma. And to say we've had a COVID-19 pandemic trauma seems extreme. Like we're, we are resilient people. And as Dr. Dempsey said, that's not the opposite of um, doing well or doing, doing poorly, the resiliency, but we're strong people. We're healthcare providers, we're educators, we're leaders. And to have these things um, disable us in the ways that we have or that, that happen um, can seem defeating, um, but 
when you don't realize exactly what you're up against, you don't know what to do about it specifically. So there's two major types of stress. One is acute, um, a one-time event, usually short in duration, uh, robbery, tornado, health event, those types of things. And then there's chronic, there's ongoing or repeated events, like domestic um, abuse or violence, historical COVID-19 event, it's ongoing. And um, the outcome can be, have some overlap in similarity, but it isn't always exactly the same. Okay, so the physiology of stress or trauma response. This is something that every single one of you is already familiar. Um, you were most likely teaching this to your students this week, in fact, the fight, flight, freeze, how those things affect when there's a traumatic stimuli, um, one, many, or ongoing, it changes the body chemistry and how we respond in order to be able to respond appropriately, right? Increased cortisol levels on and on and on, the whole sympathetic, parasympathetic systems. Um, I won't go into that because you're already the experts in that area, but sometimes when we're dealing with ourselves, we forget how much that plays a role. Um, it's not just a matter of, oh, I should get up earlier and be stronger and, you know, dig my heels in harder. The actual physiology is changing. So you have to address that and you have to adjust those things when you're combating, combating um, compassion fatigue. So for this next part, risk factors. So Take a moment to read these. And what I'd plan to do is um, typically I have everyone hold up their fingers and you can see each other how many, um, how many of these that you have. And so we can't see each other. <laughs> Cliff won't let us. Um, <laughs> sorry, just teasing. And um, <laughs> throw but to the chat. <laughs> throw, yeah, throw your number into the chat if you feel comfortable sharing. Yes. So a personal trauma, and that can be anything. Say you've had a loss of um, a member of your family to COVID or a close person to you, any kind of personal trauma, even before any of the pandemic happened, a divorce, um, a death, a, um, a child birth. Um, then the serving traumatized children or other populations, we're all doing that. So everybody's gonna have a minimum of one. Empathetic, empathetic personality traits. Again, most of us have that as well. So I would venture to say probably almost everyone. We feel deeply and we do a lot of things to um, feel better and help others feel better. High personal expectations. If you've been a successful healthcare worker and you made it through all of the programs and the training that it takes to become a healthcare provider, um, you've got high personal expectations. So that's already three. Um, overwhelming population needs. That is making the news headlines. It's everywhere. Um, it's a reason for this talk in the first place. Pre-existing physical or psychological illness. And it doesn't have to be extreme. Even if you have um, melancholy or some initial anxiety, those types of things matter. They play into um, the risk factors and they amplify everything that's happening. And then there's the first to respond to a traumatized person. And it can be long-term trauma, short-term trauma. A lot of us um, students just flow into our offices Right? And there were the first person they've talked to about whatever's going on with them, maybe related to the COVID pandemic and maybe not, maybe something else. So I'm already guessing the numbers are pretty high for the risk factors that are going to go into this group of folks that are talking today. Yep, we've already got um, several fives. I threw out there that mine was a four. Feel free to share everybody and feel free to raise your hands too. Yeah, if anybody would like to make comments. So another thing to keep in mind with that is for yourself, also think about your students and your colleagues. Some of the stuff you're not gonna know about them, but just knowing that the likelihood of the people that we have contact 
um, there's already a high percentage of us that are going to have um, a lot of risk factors associated. Okay, so these are some general individual phenomena from chronic stress that we're seeing with the COVID phenomena. Um, there's changes in health, cognition, emotion, behavior, schoolwork, socialization, and spirituality. So um, some of these things overlap, like you think, well, you know, it's just how someone's feeling and acting. Um, there's a little more to it than that. And I've included each one of the categories in different ways. And again, like I said, some, sometimes they overlap a little bit in explanation. And I did include spirituality. This is a sticky thing in um, schools. It doesn't necessarily mean religion or organized religion or things like that. Um, spirituality is the self, inner self, um, thoughts, introspection, that type of thing. So to be able to include that in the COVID um, affected things is very important because it is a big part of each of our lives, whether um, we recognize it regularly or not. Okay, so some of the clip art in here, I just think is so funny. Um, so I included it. This zebra losing its stripes, I think it's stress. I thought, oh, how many things have we blamed on this in the last two years? You know, the weight gain, um, everything from, um, you know, my hair stride, I need a haircut because you can't get in to see your hair person, uh, just all kinds of things. I think it's stress. How many of you, and you don't have to put that in the chat or anything, but have suspected that you've had COVID in the last two years, whether you have or you haven't, every tiny little thing, every sniffle, every ache, every pain, um, every tingle is concerning because of um, the increased somatic complaints. And it's separate from COVID, of course, but anything we see going on, we're hypervigilant and we think it's stress. We're going to lose our stripes. As we now all know, there is a decreased immune response when under chronic stress or an acute stress event. There's an entire field devoted to psychoimmunology in that how stress and um, trauma affect the immune system. So you can imagine like not only we've got a, a large population of our folks, all of our diabetics, our um, pulmonary, our cardiac, our you know, um, autoimmune, everybody's got some stuff going on. And then you add the decreased immune response on top of that, plus those of us who didn't have some health issues prior to that, having a decreased immune response really increases illness. There's loss of energy, loss of endurance and strength which also you walk around this way. Um, it's been referred to as a zombie. Um, when you're just walking from thing to thing, just trying to get through the day, you're exhausted. You're also prone to accidents, very prone to accidents. And then there's some of the common things like the headache, nausea, increased crying. And then crying, of course, can be very healthy. Um, however, when it becomes a problem or an obstacle in the workplace or the or school or your home, um, that's when it's not helpful. So the development of physical or mental illness. In seeing um, psychiatric patients, I my schedule is overflowing. You have to be able to set limits to those things because there's so much need out there sleep disturbance. So when you notice, this is um, one of the slides that does not have reference. Um, it is um, information that I've collected over time from folks that have gone through some real extreme situations, sometimes short-term, sometimes long-term. Again, the diminished hygiene showing up, chemical dependency, eating disorders, and um, I don't know how much you get as far as a psychiatric exposure in some of the other healthcare professions, but eating disorders are very closely associated with um, control. And we don't have a lot of control during this pandemic. So um, it, it is something that crops up more often. Cognitive symptoms. I know for myself, I have taken more notes than I have ever taken ever. 
Um, and it's because I feel like I'm going to lose information. It doesn't stay put. Um, the, the concentration impairment and the organization is not quite there. Um, taking more time to be able to address these things, which I, I believe one of the participants had mentioned, it, it takes more time to get things done. We're going outside of our usual track. We can't go on autopilot. And because of that, um, we, it, it takes more time and learning in the process. There's a flight of ideas, confusion. Um, I, I can tell you there's not a whole lot of things more confusing than the guidelines for COVID-19. Oh, it's one thing another day, another thing another day. And if you don't understand the rationale as to why those things are happening, uh, it, it's very confusing. And also paranoia, which we are seeing a lot of in the news and the political scene poor impulse control. I don't know how many of you out there have been like, I've got to work. I've got to have Starbucks today to get me through this to whereas before you'd be able to control that type of thing. If somebody hands it to you, you just drink it now. Come resentful. Weakened attention to detail because you don't have time to go over it like you once did. Um, slower cognitive processing. So it makes folks not meet deadlines quite as well. Or if they do, it's not the same with the same accuracy. Poor memory, preoccupation. Nightmares can be, um, is usually associated with a larger thing, but um, sleep disturbance in general, which can involve nightmares, happens. Impaired judgment and a loss of humor. You know, in the classroom, I like to have a good time. And it, it promotes learning. I have a good time. The students get to have a, a good time. When there's that cloud of COVID stress or any other kind of stress, you can't do that as easily. Um, it, you can turn it around, which I'll go into um, next week and even making fun of the cloud, but, uh, but it's hard to do. And you've got to be able to, you've got to have the energy to keep doing it. Emotional. So oh, I skipped one. Emotional. So these things are um, a description of all kinds of emotions, most of them not good emotions. And we all have these emotions, but they have been amplified to the point that they're um, interfering with our lives during this. Um, I do want to point out like anger, irritability, agitation. One big word I'd like to just put across the whole slide is fussy. Like a lot of us are fussy. A lot of our students are fussy um, and patients and healthcare providers. And when we're fussy, we do things that we wouldn't normally do. There's cynicism, like, oh, great. What are they going to tell us now? Um, desensitization or numbness. Like there's another one we just lost or another student's dropping out. Um, it makes us stop doing the things that we do. The hopelessness and helplessness that are associated with um, the sadness and depression. Hypersensitivity, which falls in the same lines as paranoia and cynicism. Like they ask me to lunch every day, but they're not doing it anymore. Um, something's up when really they may be concerned about their health and on their phone more. Um, you'll notice, uh, uh, and that it flows over also into the social aspects that I'll talk about here in a minute too. Um, feelings of alienation or estrangement when it, there may or may not be actual evidence of those things happening, or the evidence can be explained by um, other people experiencing symptoms of compassion fatigue. Layability of mood. I know sometimes there'll be a group of students crying and in the next 20 minutes, you'll see someone or more than one of them crying or crying and laughing and just all over the place. Which then leads to the behavioral. 
this is when it can get us into some trouble. So it doesn't always have to go to extremes. There are extremes to where there's acting out toward oneself or others. Suicide, self-harm, um, suicide rates have risen and um, violence of course has risen. So other high risk behavior is promiscuity, stealing, um, breaking other types of laws, speeding, um, decreased uh, ability to do those things and just poor decision-making. Um, the restlessness that deals with it. If you've had a bad day, which there's more bad days than there used to be, um, you start making poor decisions. There's also making excuses, um, withdrawing. So we were told to stay in our homes for a period of time, but then, um, and especially for some of us introverts, we didn't mind that. And then it's time to come back out and be social in a few situations with protect with precautions and you don't really want to you have um, you make excuses and um, find reasons to not do that it's also just lying lying to yourself um, lying to each other without realizing it those white lies i'm okay i'm fine it'll be fine it'll all get better soon when we really don't know that um, we need to be able to prepare ourselves to be better soon. Doesn't mean circumstances around us necessarily will, will do that for us. A lot of increased daydreaming because it is a safe and happy place. Um, procrastinating, stagnation, just having a moment. I think Dr. Mannion, you had said, um, you know, the procrastination, um, like sometimes you just need a moment um, and you had alluded to that to Cliff Duty that, you know, like I, I can't right now, I'm gonna have to put some things off and um, organize things a little differently than I once did. That isn't always conducive to the best way that you want to do things. School and work. So not showing up and um, tardiness. So I was very worried about when we were going to um, back on grounds that a lot of some students might have an excuse to not come <laughs> to class if they were quarantined or exposed or those types of things, because um, it's stressful. It's stressful to get back out there. It's stressful to change. So the absenteeism and tardiness um, I was concerned about. Um, we, I, in my particular program, I haven't seen a, a big problem with this and I haven't read the research, but um, I can imagine that it would be something that shows up as it has with all the places I've ever been under every circumstance. So the desire to quit doesn't always mean it happens, but um, sometimes it does. Also diminished performance or ability because um, you start cutting corners with schoolwork, with work, like I, I'll do that at another time. I'll put that in another point. Um, I'll get to it eventually, procrastination. Um, lack of visions for the future or loss of patience. Loss of patience is huge. I think several people have mentioned people want answers now. They want resolution now because they're hurting, right? One way or another, they're hurting, whether it's mild or whether it's extreme. And they want it to stop. Um, the lack of flexibility in or out of the classroom, like, um, you know, when one student wants, like, hey, do you think I could have another week on this particular assignment? Like, no, that's going to put me behind on everything else I'm doing. I can't work with you on that. It, it to whereas before it might have been something where we could have considered, but um, because of the additional stress we're under, we're reluctant or um, lack or lacking flexibility. Reluctance toward change because a lot of change is being forced upon us. And just avoiding the um, teacher student situations or other teacher situations, um, going to meetings, you know, if we can put them off or not have them, let's not do it. <laughs> or um, if we can do it in some way that makes it easier for everybody else, it makes it, um, you know, they're more likely to attend, especially optional meetings. Social. So increased sarcasm, which I find sarcasm very funny, but not everybody does. And so sometimes the sensitivity to others can play a huge role when you're used to what's making you happy and find some peace and some humor with things. Um, 
and not being sensitive to those who can't handle it, um, it does play a big role in the social impact of compassion fatigue. Minimizing significant events, the callousness or indifference, being tired of being compassionate as the uh, topic describes in itself. Increased conflict with people, family, friends, lazy communication through text, email, um, to whereas before you might've gone to see the person or even like, I know to my husband, I'll say, okay, instead of okay, or um, you know something more extensive in my explanation. The hypersensitivity shows up again in the social as well as the cognitive thinking. And just withdrawal. Sometimes you get home and you have forced yourself to be social all day long. And then your spouse or your um, family, your friends, whoever, whatever kind of household you have wants to do something and you're not up for it. So also a decreased intimacy, being close to someone in a very, very personal way, um, sharing your inner thoughts or that you're how much you're actually hurting and what to do about it. And a lot of times we do that because we're compassionate ourselves and we're not the only ones. There's an overwhelming population need. Everybody's hurting. This is recognized as symptoms for spirituality in poor self-esteem, attitude of helplessness and hopelessness, a decrease in discernment. I think somebody mentioned that um, difficult to make decisions. Um, it's harder to do. It's a decrease in just getting it done. A disinterest in introspection. I wonder how many of you wrote an extensive list when I asked you to um, write down the things about how your life has changed and what obstacles you are facing. I know a couple of the people that, uh, that answered were discussing um, things that the institution is doing or you know that they're facing as a faculty and as a group, but that you specifically, the disinterest in your introspection, how have you, what symptoms do you have? And like the list that I'm describing to, I'm gonna give the PowerPoint of course to Cliff Judy and he can give that to anyone who wants it. Um, take a look at all of these ways to describe these things and see how much of them in the long-term symptom dis descriptions apply to you. Not just the risk factors, but um, what symptoms you hadn't put on your list that actually apply to you. And kind of watch for those as we, as we um, continue to talk about those. The difficulty separating personal life from work life, it's not just difficulty, it's absolutely not. They're in the same room. So being able to do that um, effectively is impossible in some circumstances, but even when you can separate them, they become blended. You're thinking about um, home when you're at work, you know, what do your kids need? What does your spouse need? Who's the dying loved one? Who's the other person that needs you? Um, and thinking about work at home. So oftentimes work is in the next room. And just poor judgment regarding existential issues. What's gonna make you a better person and what's gonna make you a better provider or educator? Those are things we used to think about a lot. You know, you wanna be the best version of yourself and uh, there's less of that happening. Uh, one of the um, resources I've, I've told everybody about this, one of the things that I've found that show Ted Lasso is a perfect example of how um, he wants everyone that he comes in contact with to have a, um, a better, leave a little better than they were um, and have the best version of themselves that they can possibly be. If you've not seen that, you might look into it. I'll give you more lots of hints next week of how, things that can help. Um, and just a disinterest and introspection. A lot of people wouldn't even come to this particular discussion because it hurts a little. Um, and there's things that they need to have done. So stopping to um, focus on themselves and um, repair themselves and other people and do the best that you can for your students and, and your colleagues um, is so important to be able to do things effectively and do them well. But it, it does hurt a little. 
So the long-term outcomes, if we don't do something, there's overall decreased standards of care. And all of us as healthcare providers, that's not acceptable. Um, we have to be able to do what we can do and maybe be able to serve the same amount of populations, maybe not, but we've got to be able to do what we do well and be do the most that we can do. And one of the only ways we can do that is to address this compassion fatigue because it is very strong and it affects everybody. Other long-term outcomes are the changed relationships, divorces, estrangements, um, firings, quittings, a lot of people angry about um, vaccine mandates or um, you know, mask rules, those types of things where it used to be people could be friends or disagree and not um, just see things differently and agree to disagree. It's happening less and less. Um, personal failure, like I was supposed to have that done, and it's a personal failure when you don't. Um, financial ruin, unemployment, disease, illness, back into that psychoimmunology. When we're not doing well, overall, we're likely to, um, much more likely to encounter illness, whether it's physical or mental illness. And just dissatisfaction. We get a short life, folks, and um, we need to make the best of it and we need to make the best of it for others because we are leaders in this, in our communities and um, they're looking to us as to what do we do about this because um, they're hurting out there. We're hurting inside too. So we have to be able to, to do some things to come up with some, um, to avoid these long-term outcomes. So um, in times of crisis, the overwhelming psychological needs of the community are often too great for the treatment from individual providers. Um, also, many of the times the psychological providers are likely experiencing the same symptoms. Okay. This does not mean avoid asking for help if you or a student is in need. Um, I've included in the PowerPoint too some resources if you would like some of those, um, some hotline numbers and um, like Institute of Compassion Fatigue, those types of things. Dr. Dempsey also uh, mentioned some of those. We have some in all the, I'm sure all of the local schools where there can be some help to be able to um, get what you need. Um, I plan to next week give you information on how to deal with more of the um, manageable, self-manageable symptoms, but no matter what, even if you need help, you're also gonna to have to do the work yourself. And so learning how to do that and when and where and who needs what um, is, is a huge coping mechanism and to be able to pass that on as well. Okay, so for the last 30 minutes, I would like to do questions and comments, but I also want you to tell me some things. So during the presentation next week, if there are specific issues within compassion fatigue that you would like me to address, if you could tell me those, and also some of the things you're facing in your particular um, educational settings or provider settings, and um, I'll see if I can't speak um, directly to those things. So 30 minutes for questions, folks. And even if you don't have a direct question, I would like to hear a comment, something that you like, what you think of this presentation, if you think that it was helpful, if you think it wasn't, um, if it's stuff that you already knew, or if, um, like I said, if there's things that you would like me to add for next week. Throw them out folks, either in Q and A or in raising your hand, please let us know anything that we can do to help. All right, we've got Kathy Pritchard. I, I just wanna say that this has been one of the best workshops I've seen. And I think that, I think this needs to go out to more people. I personally am not in the health field, but I am in education. And um, I could relate to everything you're saying. So I just, I wish my coworkers and colleagues could all hear this because it's been very, very helpful. Good, good. Kathy, um, give it to them. Um, it'll be recorded. And sometimes you can do um, 
like educational methodology, especially on the part where I'm going to um, have suggestions of how to put this into your curriculum. I know almost every school has an educational methodology um, content that they need for accreditation. So um, adjuncts, especially, um, but yes, pass it out. It's, oh, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I appreciate absolutely. that. Sure thing. Thank you so much for the comment. Yes, we are recording. We're going to be putting this out um, for everybody. We're going to put the recording out for everybody. We'll be posting it, um, all of that stuff. And I think it's a tribute to Dr. Ferguson. Like I, like you just said, like I said, maybe 10 minutes ago or so, there's so much overlap. Um, we're not just talking about healthcare industry and we're not just talking about the education environment. Um, I think it's, I think it's relevant across industries and across environments. And um, yeah, anybody else? Okay, Sheila. We've got you, Sheila, oh, I'm, if you're ready. I'm sorry, you I'm sorry. I, I have my, my uh, speaker on and I can actually turn it off, so. I was off, sorry about that. Um, Dr. Ferguson, thank you so much. I do appreciate everything. Uh, and yes, I would agree that this needs to go out to a wider audience because it doesn't, I don't think it just affects uh, healthcare workers. I think it affects everyone across the board. Um, certainly uh, in my other chosen field of veterinary medicine, we've been talking about this at a national level for years. Um, veterinarians have the highest suicide rate of any profession in the United States. And so this has been a, a big concern of our national organization. And so I've dealt in a lot of this for a long time uh, and coming from myself out of about seven years of private practice, uh, I was in that area of compassion fatigue burnout. And that's why I was looking for something else. And now I've been in education for 25 years and now I'm looking at it going, oh my Lord, I'm back there again with this compassion fatigue in education. I had a colleague just yesterday tell me that usually during the summer he gets recharged. Uh, even though he's teaching, he's teaching online, usually have a better, or I won't say a better quality, but usually students that are very motivated because they're doing it, microbiology in a short period of time. And so he gets energized from that and he didn't get the, that this year. And it's just been, he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's very hard for myself to go, oh, well, you know, you know, it's going to get better. It's going to get better when I'm sitting here going, uh, yeah, it's not going to get any better. <laughs> And I'm re the only thing that's really keeping me going is I am retiring in 259 days. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my big thing. And that's, that's the goal at this point. But then I have to go, okay, what else am I going to do with my life? So there's a stress on that as well of like of retirement. So I think this does need to be across a wider audience and um, I'm going to talk this up to some of my colleagues. I'm not going to be able to attend next Wednesday because I'm going to be in class, but I will look forward to the uh, recording of it because this has been very, very helpful and I thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Sheila. Appreciate it. Thank your... you, Sheila. And not that you're keeping, uh, keeping count toward retirement, right? <laughs> um, Please do spread the word. Please do spread the word. Um, everybody who's an MCCA member was able to register, you know, through um, through our process, and and you know, we were able to track who has signed up and everything like that. But uh, if you have the link, if you have the Zoom link, you do not have to be an MCCA member. We talked earlier about inviting the CMU um, instructors and the University of Missouri instructors. We have structured, we have set up the settings of this Zoom, uh, of these Zooms to where the only registration that you need to do is when you click on the Zoom link, it'll ask you your first name, your last name, and your email. That's it. If you put that in, you're registered, you have access to this Zoom, this is not a private thing. So spread it far, spread it wide, let more people know, um, and hopefully we'll have an even bigger crowd next week. Um, we did have 
a uh, Sarah threw this into the Q and A. Uh, this has been amazing. Thank you. I have to agree. Uh, big thank you to Dr. Ferguson, Dr. Hutton Gann, Dr. Dempsey, our sponsors over at uh, Central Methodist. Um, and now moving on to our question here. I think during this time, it has been really challenging not to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Do you have tips on how to find that balance between doing a good job and not expecting perfection? Yes, I do. And it is so hard. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges that we face as go-getters. So I will go into that in detail next week um, to where I give um, some tips about that self-talk thinking and setting expectations. So yes, I do. I'd, I could go on about it for probably a, a great deal of time. So I don't know that we have enough time to actually answer that question here, but I, yes, I will address that for sure. Highly motivated and empathetic people who expect perfection from themselves? No way. <laughs> Let's see if we have any other folks raising their hands. Please do, uh, please do raise your hands and, and throw a question out there, throw any feedback out there. This is every single one of you who is throwing something out there is helping us for next week. And I'd like to hear from Dr. Rhonda Hutton Gann and Dr. Dempsey um, about things that um, you think uh, are helpful or things that you think that could be added or um, just additional comments or thoughts. So um, Dr. Dempsey uh, and Dr. Ferguson, I wanna thank you both. Um, and uh, Cliff, thank you for putting together um, what's always my vision and uh, making it come to a reality. So appreciate that. Um, I, I do want to um, just comment on the moral injury because I think that sums up what a lot of people feel. And um, I haven't had a word for it or a phrase for it. And now I do, so um, watch out staff because I'm probably gonna be throwing that around quite a bit. Um, I think it describes for at least healthcare, the constant conflict between um, those for and those against vaccines, those for and those against masking, the conflict within the communities that we see, um, Dr. Ferguson called it judging, um, just, you know, that um, the, the conflict and social changes that have happened, not to mention those taking care of patients, right? And um, clients and whatever area you're in, but there's much more conflict um, perceived or otherwise in everyday life than I think there used to be just based upon um, different motivations. Um, so uh, thank you for that word because it's going to get used a lot. <laughs> but um, I think that uh, I, I really appreciate Dr. Ferguson's summary of um, the symptoms and I'm looking forward to next week and some of the solutions and um, see where we go from there. Well, from my perspective, I think it's been great. I think it's been interesting as an educator. Uh, uh, so I, I have kind of a foot in both worlds. So I also teach at Missouri State and um, I think it has been um, interesting to watch my nursing students as they're going out into their, um, their final clinical rotation, taking patients. And um, it's, it's hard right now in healthcare. And I think being able to give them a name for what they're feeling and to uh, affirm what they're feeling and to give them ways to cope, I think are some of the things that um, as an educator, 
I feel like I have to do if I want these people to stay in in the profession. So I think this has been good and I, I look forward to Wednesday. Great, thank you. Yes, and if it's okay with you, I would like to add moral injury to my list of words. Yes, I didn't coin that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to give me attribution. I just think it's great and it, it's, it sums up what a lot of people are feeling right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Let's see, next person is Amy Sage. What do you think? Comments or questions? All right, Amy, you've been called out. Amy is with Central Methodist. They are Wonderful. our sponsors here. They are a big part of uh, what was, uh, of making this happen. So Amy, if you've got us, throw it out there, please do. And if anybody else wants to raise their hands, by all means. We'll come to everybody eventually. We might not have Amy. <laughs> okay. Why don't we do Michael Schroer? Let me find him. There's Michael. Michael, you got us? Or maybe everyone's hiding now. Let's see here. Or Keith Acuff. So you're going to make sure I'm here, huh? Aren't you? <laughs> oh, there we are. There we go. That was that was a, that was a check, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting listening from um, an administrative standpoint because. You know, we don't stand in front of the students every day um, and interact with them on that one-to-one -one basis. But at the same time, you feel kind of a, I guess I'd almost say a moral responsibility, moral responsibility to, to have the, um, the wellness of the entire institution, so to speak, um, kind of flowing through, through your, your doors in a way and knowing the decisions that you make that are necessary may or may not um, help that. So it's it's a little different, but it's the same kind of um, aspect you've all been talking about, about the, you know, people do want answers right away. And, and the, and the um, background to the answers change, you know, every day. And, and so the answer you gave yesterday, while right yesterday may not be right today, and that frustrates people. Um, and I understand, so, so you get that frustration. So I'm not sure where the question was, Andra, but uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, even just beyond the teacher, those, those and the students, and all, but those that are there trying to support all of that feel that same kind of frustration of, of the unknown and, uh, you know, all the symptoms you put out there and knowing that, that, you know, the frustration of not being able to do anything about it sometimes and, and wanting to do something about it. Uh, so Anyway, that's kind of kind of my takeaway on a, on a lot of what it what what been saying here today, and so yeah, Andra, you got me, but I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. I appreciate the feedback. Thanks very much, Keith. Anybody else? What about Lee Wilson? We'll do Lee, and then we'll do you, Cliff Judy. All right, we've got Lee and Lee just unmuted. So I think we've we've got them. Got you now, Lee Wilson. Maybe we've got them. <laughs> hmm. Okay, we could just do yours. Cliff, Judy, what are your comments and questions? And if anybody else, oh, we have a new message too. We do? Oh, the mic's not working for Lee. Oh, computer was refigured yesterday and the mic isn't working. 
All right. Uh, well, Lee, I tell you what, whatever your, uh, whatever your comments were, feel free to type them up for the chat or type them up in Q and A and I'll go. And hopefully by the time, um, hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll be good to go or you'll have typed that up. I mean, um, you know, I, at the risk of, at the risk of repeating some of what Dr. Ferguson said, um, I think it's, it, it, this, this was not an easy conversation, right? This was a, this is a difficult thing to talk about. And for some people, I think it might be cathartic. Um, I think it is for me certainly to actively go through examining, okay, what she's talking about, how does it apply and everything like that. Um, but next week we're going to be talking about those solutions. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's a hard conversation, but it's an important conversation. I think for a lot of people, it's a conversation that you, a lot of people would maybe just rather not have because it's easier not to have that conversation. Um, so I, that was kind of one of those things that kept going through my mind throughout, um, uh, uh, just along with how much all of this applies Again, not just to healthcare, not just to the higher education environment, um, and how many times I've experienced these same things over the last year and a half, even though for most of that, I was in the world of journalism, which has been going through a lot of, we can't step away from, you know, we can't step away from the really hard news, even though at the same time that we can't step away from it, we were telling our viewers if you feel stressed out by this, or if this is affecting your life, maybe just put it on, maybe just turn the TV off for a little while. Don't be connected to the news 24 seven, because right now is a really difficult time for us. Um, so not an easy conversation to have. And I thank Dr. Ferguson again for helping us through that conversation and looking forward. It's really nice to now having had this conversation go more into a solutions oriented conversation for next week and start talking about how we can build this into our curriculum and how we can really help our students. Um, like I said, we're represented today by nine different community colleges from around the state. I know CMU has people on um, and, and hopefully this is going to be the kind of thing that gets out there. You know, when you have this many people in a room who are focused on what we're talking about, that's going to serve our hospital systems for a long time. It's going to serve our community colleges for a long time. It's going to serve our patients for a long time. So um, yeah, that yeah, we're, we're doing a little bit of a shift into next week, focusing on solutions. And I think that's going to be um, really awesome. Okay. We've got Lee. I don't know if you were able to type up your thoughts or your comments, but we do have um, something from Sarah again. Um, she said, has anyone else experienced the need to be kinder in some areas than prior to COVID? I find that I am looking at other ways to be helpful or just plain kind and courteous. Yes, um, Sarah, that is a, a common thing that happens, um, almost like we have to compensate. Um, so for like a missing parent type of thing, or if things didn't go well in one situation, um, you know, trying to make it better in another situation. Um, I've even in challenged some of my students, like, um, which one of you can be nicer today? <laughs> you know, and they kind of jovially, you know, you don't want to inspire competition, but at the same time, when it's a fun, lighthearted competition, um, it has been very helpful for them. So, so yes, it does. You find yourself wanting to try harder in areas that you can, because some areas you can't. And so, uh, yes, it does, absolutely. So I knew I would be called on. Kathy and Sheila both chimed in and said um, that they agree. Um, you know, Kathy said, agree, making a point to be extra nice to workers. And then Sheila mentioned, I try to have greater kindness because I know what that they're going through the same things. Um, so Lee did jump in. She said she knew that she was going to be called on. Uh, and, uh, or I'm sorry, Lee. Um, what is that? What is the best way to approach students and faculty to check in with how they're doing emotionally? That's a great question. So um, I have a few tips about that that I'll go into a little more extensively next week. But for now, um, some of the things are just say it 
um, because we're all experiencing those things. Um, it's the elephant in the room. And sometimes you can use evidence as to why you might be asking, like, I noticed you had a hard time um, in class. I noticed you're having a hard time um, concentrating or just how are you? Um, check in with me. Um, you can even make it kind of a, a joke or a thing. So I'm doing a compassion fatigue check. <laughs> Where are you sitting? You know, and um, getting people to talk about it at all is going to be beneficial. Even if there's a superficial answer initially, it is something that they're going to think about later that day. It is something where they're going to do a little bit of introspection and self-care. Um, so if you just say it, just ask or even um, sharing how you're doing. Like, I'm struggling with this. Are you guys? Uh, how's everybody else in the class? I'm losing attention. You guys want to do a lap and then we'll come back and address this issue. So um, getting it out there is how I would answer um, to that, Lee Wilson, and um, just having a starting point because if somebody doesn't make the first move, no one will. And um, we're the leaders, right? We're the ones who are going to be compassion fatigue informed. So uh, we can we can do this. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, if anybody else wants to raise their hand or has a comment or anything like that, please, please speak now. Um, we've got four minutes left in our scheduled amount of time. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, did you want to wrap us up or uh, are we giving folks oh, now three minutes, uh, three minutes of their time back? No worries. Um, so I am finished with the concepts and I'm um, finished as far as this particular aspect goes. And um, then next week, I think we'll be able to address more things. And also, if you want to send um, Cliff Judy any types of things that you didn't have time to write in or um, speak about during this session and you want them to be addressed, feel free to do that. And um, he just posted the cell phone number and, and most people I think probably have his email and that type of thing. So um, so do do that. Um, we wanna give you all the information that you need or want as well as we can usually have some sources that are available in your areas, um, help sources, those types of things. And so, uh, Yes, it, it will be um, it'll be a good session next week for sure. Absolutely. I also threw into the chat for everybody. I mean, if you registered for this webinar, then of course you already have um, a lot of this information. But like we said, share it far, share it wide. We want as many people as possible to be in attendance next week. We're going to be talking again on Wednesday, the 13th at 10 a.m. The link is in the chat. My cell is in the chat. My email is in the chat. Um, hit me up anytime if you have feedback, if you have anything that you're looking to uh, talk about on Wednesday. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Like I said, this was uh, Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Hutton Ganner from State Fair Community College, Dr. Christy Dempsey. She is with Press Ganey. Uh, I'm Cliff Judy. I'm with MCCA or Missouri Community College Association. Um, we're ready to talk. Hit us up with feedback and hopefully we'll see everybody and then some on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks everybody.